Andy Larson will be covering for the Salt Lake Tribune, and he's kind enough to uh, join us here on uh, on a Monday Bill Riley show. Andy, how are you? I'm doing well, Bill. Uh, let's start first with the news of the weekend, the Royce O'Neal deal. Uh, four years, $36 million, which I think is great for Royce. I think should be pretty good for the Utah Jazz. What did you make of the contract deal given to Royce O'Neal? Yeah, you know, honestly, at this point of the season, I thought we were going into free agency with this thing because – you look at the other free agents available in this market, and you know I, I honestly think Royce could have gotten more than nine million dollars a year. I think uh, you know it, he could have gotten ten, eleven, twelve, and at that point, it may just behoove him to go into free agency because there was a limit on how much they could offer in this extension, about eleven million dollars a year. So that the Jazz are able to get it done for nine million per year is a is a steal from my point of view. And then uh, that the last year, Tony Jones, our, our friend, uh, you know reported that it, the last year is partially guaranteed. So um, that can help deal out even more from a Jazz perspective. You know, obviously it's it's good for Royce, too, and, and you know, it probably doesn't really matter to him the difference between earning $36 million and, and $48 million, let's say. You know, it, it's all, it all feels pretty good in the end for him, especially as a guy who came out, uh, you know, as undrafted, worked his way up through the European leagues, and then, uh, you know, was kind of the 15th guy on the roster on a minimum contract for the last three years. So it's it's kind of a good deal for both sides, but it's it's a good piece of business by the Jazz for sure. If I have you identify Royce O'Neal's biggest value to the Utah Jazz, it's what? Defensive versatility. It's his ability to guard in the last week both Kyrie Irving and Brandon Ingram. Um, it's his ability to guard guys like Giannis Antetokounmpo, which he's done for two games this season. And then switch over and guard someone like Damian Lillard. And what that allows the Jazz to do is kind of cross-match in the other spots. So you can hide a, a Mike Conley if you need to against a bigger guy and a, a, maybe a wing player and, and you're, you're doing okay. Um, or you can have Rudy Gobert protect the paint even though Giannis is probably coming at you from 40 feet away. You know, So it, it kind of gives you just kind of the ability to cross-match, um, which uh, you know I, I think is, is something that the Jazz do really well and is, is part of their really – is a really valuable part of their defense. Um, you know, obviously he's he's pretty good at defending those guys too. So I think that's it. And then you know, obviously just the ability to catch and make three point shots this year. He's at forty four percent. You know, you're you're obviously thrilled with that. I, I, another one of our friends, Ben Anderson, wrote to KSL dot com that with this new contract, the Jazz should expect to get more from Royce O'Neal. Do you agree with that premise? You know, talking to Dennis Lindsay yesterday, he didn't agree with that. You know, it was we kind of asked him like, "Look, where are you looking for Royce to improve?" And he said, "Just continue to star in his role." And he said, Dennis said that was the same thing that he told Rudy Gobert when he signed his four-year, hundred million dollar extension that he's still on. Is like, look, we're not looking for you to be to change who you are as a result of this deal. We're looking for you to become better at the player you are. And you know, we've seen the the result of that with the defensive player of the year trophies that, that Rudy's gotten. So I think, you know, I think it's continuing to improve on the defensive end. I think it's continuing to work on his shot, uh, you know, maybe become a little bit better of a ball handler in order to take advantage of when teams close out on him. And, you know, we certainly see guys develop in this jazz system, even, you know, at the age of 26 and beyond, which is what Royce O'Neal is. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think that in order for him to be, to live up to this deal that he needs to be a substantially better player than what he is. Cause you, you look at what three and D players are worth in the open market now. And it, it really is in the double digit million dollars a year. So uh, given that Royce fits that, that kind of criteria, I, I, I think he's, he's well paid right now, you know, and uh, as it continues to increase, you know, at the end of this deal, he's only going to be paid 7% of the cap. You're pretty, you're pretty thrilled with that. So with that said, if we do, Hope to, it's not required or necessary. Just get better within the role. But if outside of being the three and D guy, where might we see some improvement in Royce O'Neal's game over the next three to four years? Yeah, you know, I, I think the attacking closeouts is is kind of a, a a big piece of it. Is if he can get kind of those one, two, three dribble moves and and get all the way to the rim. Um, you know, I, I think he's actually a very good playmaker for what he is, but you, you really probably don't want him running pick and roll. He's never been that kind of guy, even back from his college days. And so, uh, you know, you could see him maybe start doing that a little bit, but the Jazz have so many pick and roll ball handlers that it doesn't really make sense for him to do that. So, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's kind of the little things. 
I'd like to see him get a little bit stronger on, on defense against some of the quicker guys. You know, I, I do think he struggled against Brandon Ingram in that game last week. Um, you know, I, I think he, he does have some times when I think he's a very physical defender, and I think he's good against kind of the bigger wings like the Paul Georges, uh, you know, even the LeBron Jameses of the world. But if, if he can kind of get some more lateral quickness to keep up with maybe the Dame and the, the Brandon Ingrams, kind of the quicker, longer guys, uh, you know, I, I think that can help him. But, again, we're, we're talking about differences in degrees here, not wildly, you know, changing his game. Andy Larson's our guest, uh, Jazz Insider and Beat Writer at the Salt Lake Tribune. Um, Jazz have the Indiana Pacers tonight. It will be a little bit of a reunion show for Boyan Bogdanovich tonight, his team, the team that he played for before coming to the Utah Jazz. I kind of feel like Boyan Bogdanovich might be the -the under-the-radar best acquisition around the league this past offseason, Andy, the one nobody talks about. Conley got all the headlines, and rightfully so here, and we'll see how that works out. We'll talk about Mike in a minute. But Bogdanovich, I think, and you would know this maybe better than I, I think he had his ninth 30-point scoring game last night. Is that right? Yeah, and, and he's been, I mean, he's been terrific, obviously. You know, like That's what I mean. I, I think he had, he had 27 points and 10 shots through the first three quarters of, of the Sacramento game. And it's like, and, you know, he was kind of getting made fun of on Twitter because he had, like, one assist and one rebound in those 27 points. He had that 35-0-0-0 game last week, right? But if you score 27 points on 10 shots, you can go, you can go talk to the cheerleaders when you don't have the ball for all I care. Cause you're just, <laughs> you're just that good as a scorer. And I think that's what we've seen for Bogey so far. I talked to him one on one the other day, um, when, when we were in DC and he, he told me, you know, I asked him like, you know, you went from kind of being the number one guy for half a season in Indiana to being the number two or number three guy here in Utah. And yet you're still scoring more points. Why is that? And he really credited Quinn Snyder and his offense for being able to kind of find him in positions when he can succeed. You know, like he's he's running a, a bogey off of those screens. He's setting up, uh, you know, he's setting him up in the corner to be able to hit those shots off of, say, double screens for Donovan Mitchell, which he knows is going to be taking that attention away from Donovan. And so all of a sudden you have this guy that is kind of the guy that, I think Jazz fans have dreamed about for a long time, a guy who's actually able to hit the shots that Quinn Snyder's offense sets up. Uh, and it, it's been a terrific fit so far. So, you know, credit to Bogey, credit to Quinn, and credit to everyone for making that work. Well, he, you can see Donovan Mitchell isn't pressing nearly as much on the offensive end this year, Andy. 41 games in, Donovan's numbers are terrific too, but it doesn't appear that he's pressing to score the way he did at times last year. And now you've got a bona fide number two score for him that on any given night, if need be, could be a number one score. Well, and I love what they do in the clutch, too, which is, and maybe the New Orleans game accepted just because Donovan was going so crazy in that game with the 46 points, but they really are kind of trading off possessions between Bogey and Donovan. Having Bogey come up, set that 1-3 screen for Donovan, uh, and, and then say, okay, Donovan, you can either attack and go off if you know if they screw up the switch, or you've got Bogey coming off and, and popping out for that open three. So uh, he really has like given the Jazz a second option, and I think you're right, taking the load off of Donovan Mitchell, so he's not so exhausted at the end of those games. Brings us to Mike Conley, uh, reemerged the other night um, in in the lineup, scored very little, played okay, 15 minutes, but it was his first game back, no doubt about that. I had said for a couple of weeks, and Tony and I went back and forth on this, that you know, if, if, if I was Quinn, I'd probably bring him off the bench for a couple of games, let him ease his way back in, and Tony, to his credit, texted me and said, I think he's going to be coming off the bench, and you were, you were right. I don't know if I was right or wrong, but I think it was a good way to ease him back in. Again, yeah. not not great production the other night out of him, but I'd just be curious what you think of where Conley is right now and you know how long do you think it will take for us to see Mike Conley? Will we see Mike Conley be Mike Conley this year? Yeah, you know, I, first of all, he only played the 15 minutes, right, against Sacramento. Right. And, um, you know, I, I, that was the minutes restriction, and so I, I do expect him to kind of move into the starting lineup as that goes from 15 to 18 to 21 to so on and so forth, right? Um, but I, you know, I, I, I do think that, you know, I, his role has been decreased a little bit. Um, he, he's going to be another one of those guys who's going to be taking some possessions from Donovan Mitchell, some from bogey, to be quite frank. Um, and, and I, you know, it really kind of depends on what kind of player he is and whether or not he can start hitting, especially that, that mid range floater is really kind of the key shot for him, right? Like 
he's shooting relatively well from three. He's shooting 36% from three. You're fine with that. But he's also only shooting 36% from two-point range, and that's what you can't have. So if he can start getting that floater going that really has been so good for him throughout his career, then I, you know, I think it'll be fine. And, and, and given you know, the, the 11 years that we know of what Mike Conley is, I, I think it probably will be okay. I'm not sure he's ever going to get to the rim as, as much as he did in his prime and, and maybe not draw as many free throws as he did. You know, I, I, that's kind of the normal aging process for guys as they enter their 30s. But, um, you know, I, I think that if he can really start hitting that mid-range shot, then, you know, all of a sudden the Jazz have this really kind of unique lineup where you just have weapons everywhere on the floor that you have to guard. You know, I, I thought that, that one possession at the end of the first quarter – the, they had six or seven passes in like eight seconds, finds Donovan Mitchell in, in the corner. I'm not sure that play happens without Mike Conley, not only because of his ability to swing it quickly, but because of how worried they were about Mike Conley as a shooting threat compared to someone like Emmanuel Moutier, for example. So let, let's say Mike Conley regains Mike Conley-ish form here in the next three weeks or so. What's your ideal closing lineup? What's your ideal final five minutes lineup? I, you know, I think it's the one that we've uh, honestly may start uh, in, in the next week. It's, it's Conley, Boganovich, Mitchell, uh, Joe Ingles, and, and Rudy Gobert. And I think Joe's shown an ability to guard some of the best guys in the league in, in years past in, in playoffs and regular season. And while you might say he's not quite as good of a defender as, as Royce O'Neal, he can he can take those challenges on. And so I think you're, you're probably pretty good at, at the defensive end and that just quite frankly, kind of ridiculous on the offensive end where you have the best shooting team in the league um, with Rudy Gobert rolling down down the paint. You know, I, it's it's just going to be really tough to stop. So uh, the I've called it on Twitter the Bogo Dojo Co. lineup just because uh, all those players have that in their names. Um, so we'll, we'll go with that one. Okay, fair enough. Uh, anything else popping for you right now? What do you expect? You were down in New Orleans, weren't you? Yeah, I was. Well, what's the what's the buzz about Zion returning this week? Yeah, I, they're they're excited. I mean, I think they're a little bit perturbed that it's taken this long, and it, you know, the the people I talked to at that game were hoping that it was going to be that game. You know, there's that rumor that said he was going to be returning against the Jazz, and then they pushed it back a week. But they're excited for him. You know, they're they, that's the guy who they're pinning their franchise's hopes on, especially after years and years of kind of being. Uh, 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 upset, honestly, with Anthony Davis being in and out of the lineup, asking for trades, as everything else. They're looking at this guy as the future of the franchise, and so um, you know the the scuttlebutt is that he looks good in, in warmups, that he's you know really really close to being ready to play, and and or he may be ready to play now. It's just kind of be a, a being a cautious thing is the reason he hasn't and. I, you know, I think everyone's kind of excited for what this guy's going to be able to do. Is it too late to expect, with a healthy Zion, them to make a playoff run for an eight spot this year? No, I, I, I you know, they've been so good in the last couple of weeks. I mean, they've won nine of their last thirteen now. Um, they're, they, they gave the Clippers a run for the money. You obviously saw the Jazz game last week, but that's a good team. You know, I think Derek Favors does a lot for them. Brandon Ingram has obviously taken a leap. Then you look at getting Drew, Drew Holiday and JJ Redick back too. I mean, that's that's actually a really good team. I mean, no real NBA team has had they 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 push the ball so much that it's just really hard to stop them. I mean, the Clippers gave them 130 points. Obviously, the Jazz gave them 130 points. Those are two really good defensive teams that could figure out how to stop the Pelicans, and I would not be at all shocked to see them move up into that eighth spot by the time the season's done. Who are you more surprised by, the Heat or the Mavericks? Um, I am more surprised by the Heat. And I, I kind of I, I have to give Jimmy Butler a lot of credit there. Jimmy Butler, instead of looking at the team where he's like, okay, I'm the only go-to big-name superstar on this roster, Instead of being like, okay, this is my opportunity to try to score 30, he's turned himself into a all-around passer. He's having the best passing season of his career. He's having the best rebounding season of his career. He's finding guys like Duncan Robinson open for threes. You know, it, it, and you have to give Eric Spolster credit for that, obviously, as well. But, I mean, I think Jimmy Butler has kind of turned – he had kind of this reputation as a me-first guy, and I think maybe because of his play or, or his attitude, at least, with the Minnesota Timberwolves. But – came into Miami in a good situation and became really team first and really uh, moving the ball is really just kind of 
a cog in their offense that has worked really well. So that to me is like surprising from both their production is now they're the second best team in the East so far this year. And just from a, a player changing the way he plays, um, you know, Dallas is obviously a good story and I, I think, but they're, they're really talented and, and maybe a, a leap from Luca like this wasn't that surprising given what we knew, what he could be. Uh, read his triple team every day after a jazz game at the pages of the Salt Lake Tribune. If you're a jazz fan, it's a good reason to spend that money each and every month on the uh, on the Salt Lake Tribune. Andy, thanks as always. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. There you go. Andy Larson. 